Hi everybody, I'm Amanda Fox and I'm the Tour and Outreach Coordinator at Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. Hi everybody, I'm Carly, the Instructional Coordinator at Los Luceros Historic Site. The Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project and Los Luceros Historic Site have partnered in this collaborative lecture series, Mesa Talks. Together we are pleased to continue to offer the microphone to exciting and visionary speakers who enrich our understanding of the history, culture, arts, and more of Northern New Mexico. I'm super looking forward to this talk and thank you all for joining us. Um, we as at Los Luceros are really happy to be in a partnership with Mesa Prieta because even though our site is so closed, we are able to provide you with amazing content like today's talk with Chester. Um, if you want any more virtual content, check our New Mexico Historic Sites virtual summer camp uh, available on our Facebook page and on our website. Make sure to sign up for Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project's newsletter and follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all of the latest news, events, and upcoming virtual tour content. Today we are pleased to present our own Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project's archaeologist, Dr. Chester Levosh. He will be presenting Conserving Sonic Heritage, the Importance of Soundscapes to Rock Art Landscapes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. And before I jump into my talk, I would like to remind everyone that our uh, next installment of the Mesa Talks uh, series will be on the, as usual, last Tuesday of the month. So it'll be on the last Tuesday of July. It'll be Matthew Barber, who will be discussing an archaeological perspective on hunting in New Mexico. So please uh, tune in for that. And uh, without any further ado, let's get started. Hello, and thank you all for tuning in. I'm Chester Levash, the project archaeologist for the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, and I'll be discussing today archaeoacoustics and how archaeological interest in sound in the past can lead us to new considerations for conservation moving forward, an area that I will be calling, for the sake of this talk, sonic heritage. Before we get started, I would like to thank, of course, the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, as well as our partner organization, Los Luceros State Historic Site, for hosting the Mesa Talks lecture series and, of course, for inviting me to contribute. Before diving in too deeply here, it's probably prudent to define exactly what I mean by archaeoacoustics. After all, this is probably a word that many of you haven't really heard too much, and yet it's one that I'm going to be coming back to time and again throughout the course of this presentation. Simply put, archaeoacoustics is when archaeologists take interest in the study of sound and its relationship to the past using the material record. The topics that archaeologists are mostly interested in when it comes to archaeoacoustics can be broken down into just a few simple categories. Sources, spaces, and audiences. So in sources and spaces, of course, we have musical instruments, traditional songs, and a concept called soundscapes, which we'll come back to. On the other side, it's prudent to consider who's listening. Of course, there's the individual quote-unquote artist or performer. Of course, the word artist might be troublesome here, but I'm sure that you understand what I'm trying to convey when I say the word artist, and we can break down into a critique of that in a different talk. So one potential listener would be the individual artist or performer. Uh, of course, there were larger audiences, both small private audiences as well as large public audiences in the past. So it's good to consider who is the intended audience, what is their size, and this can elucidate some details about social structure in the past. And we shouldn't discount the modern day observer as we ourselves are participating in the conservation and experience of sound, especially when we're interacting with it in archaeological spaces. Now, some 
more cynical critics of the field of archaeoacoustics may suggest that we can only determine the experience of the modern day observers and that the past individuals and past publics are both forever relegated to the realm of the purely speculative. Personally, I'm not so nihilistic in my approach, and while it may be clearest how modern day observers interact with sound in archaeological spaces and with archaeological artifacts, there is still a lot that we can learn about the past, both on the individual and the community levels, through the study of sound. And while in archaeology we're always working with an incomplete record, that's not to say that pursuits of uh, such difficult and often intangible topics like sound can't actually be approached in a systematic and scientific way. In fact, I do believe they can, and this is why this is a part of my research. It is worthwhile mentioning a little bit of the psychology of sound, uh, especially since some of the basic principles behind uh, psychoacoustics, the psychology of sound, are going to be important for some of the things that we'll be covering. I've broken this down into five simple categories. Uh, echo, which is really just sound reflections. These are often perceived as coming from another source, uh, often seemingly behind the surface that's actually reflecting the sound waves. We notice this in the ethnographic record, in oral traditions. There will often be traditional stories that associate echoes with particular mythological beings. And this is a part of because of the physics of echoes. Like I said, echoes, if you're paying close attention, can seem to come from behind the reflecting surface. This is because, much like light reflecting off of a mirror, sound waves reflecting off of a surface are going to have the perceived distance as something that has traveled that cumulative distance of to the reflecting surface and back from it, rather than just the one-way trip back from it. Now, when echoes start to arrive too closely together, we get into our next effect, reverberation. Reverberation happens when sound becomes unclear. And this is because it is really defined as when echoes arrive so closely that the brain can't sort out the individual echo events. This is somewhat similar to if you're looking at, say, flipbook animation, and as you speed up the frame rate through or, or through a flipbook, you'll start to perceive motion. And in, in that sense, that perception of motion from still images changing rapidly, that's happening because your visual cortex operates at a certain frequency, and when you start to flip images at a rate significantly faster than that, the brain is going to start to read that as motion. Similarly with sound, when sound waves start to arrive with such frequency that that can be represented as a sound wave itself, in other words, if we think about the bottom of human hearing, 20 hertz, that means 20 cycles per second. If you get echoes arriving closer than 1 20th of a second apart, or 50 milliseconds, then you're going to end up with a sort of similar cognitive blending between these. Of course, we all have experienced reverberation, whether it's in you know, your favorite song or whether you've experienced it, say, walking down an art gallery. Um, so we intuitively know what reverberation sounds like, but when we break it down on the level of the physics of sound and the psychology of sound, we notice that it takes on some extra effects that are not typically a part of echo effects. And these can include uh, a sense of sound coming from all around, which we'll get into next, but also 
if the sound is intense enough, it takes on a, a tactile quality, something that we call haptics. In other words, you can feel the pressure of the sound waves on your skin. Next is the, uh, the precedence effect. So the precedence effect is one of the psychological effects of sound. And this happens when reverb confuses the listener about the direction that the source of the sound is located in. If we go back to that analogy of walking down an art gallery, okay, so imagine, imagine a, a large room, high ceilings, long corridor, but maybe the walls are a little close together, right? It's got kind of a hall effect. And so when you're in this gallery, uh, your footsteps are off, echoing off the surface in front of you, off the surface behind you. And then some of those, yeah, some of those spread out down the corridor, but some of those reflect back towards the source. And so you begin to hear your, your footsteps from three or four footsteps back. Um, when these are arriving at the same time as another sound, say you're at within 50 milliseconds, you get an echo off the surface in front of you, off the surface behind you, and then one each from further on down the corridor to the right and to the left, it becomes difficult for your brain to sort out where the actual source of sound is. Even if you know that the original source of the sound was your footsteps, and what you're really hearing is one or two footsteps back, when by the time that echo uh, comes from either of the, the far ends, it still creates this uh, sort of confusion. Sometimes this can be perceived as the source of sound being over on this side or over on the opposite side. And that's the precedence effect. And it can give you the sense that there is someone or something else there that is not otherwise perceivable. This is very important in the way that uh, some traditional cultures remember and communicate notions of sound and echo in their oral traditions. Next, we'll talk about one of my uh, favorite topics, but one of the most elusive ones is acoustical resonance. Resonance tends to happen in some, not all spaces re with reverberation, but it is one of the things that can happen when reverb starts to, to hit into that auditory range. And resonance is really the accentuation of particular tones in an enclosed space based on the mathematical relationship between each tone's wavelength and the, the dimensions of that space. So each wavelength is an integer divisor of one or more of the dimensions of that space, or you could describe the, uh, the sound waves also as multiples of, well, in, in the terms of frequencies, as multiples of that fundamental frequency that is the dimension of the space. For example, if we have a space that is 10 meters across, that's going to have a particular resonant tone that corresponds with a wavelength of 10 meters. Now, depending on a number of variables, humidity, temperature, elevation, pressure, the speed of sound actually kind of changes. So that wavelength could be associated actually with a range of tones depending on these variables. But probably a 10 meter wave is going to be just below the human hearing range of 20 hertz. Now, when I say that it's also multiples, resonant tones can also be multiples of that wavelength. That's the dimension of the space. That's what we call the fundamental wavelength. Then these multiples, say of uh, 10 hertz, uh, or whatever the, uh, the hertz reading is for that 10 meter wave at your given settings, that means also a five meter wave will fit in there, a two and a half meter wave. Now this is definitely getting firmly into the auditory range as well as a one-third meter wave will repeat 30 times in that 10 meter space. All of these are what we call resonant tones. However, 
a seven meter long wavelength will actually be dampened by the shape of that space because it's going to create destructive interference. And so when we have a resonant space, you will hear certain tones accentuated while other tones are dampened. And those tones that are accentuated actually kind of tell you something about the shape of that space. Finally, there's infrasound. Infrasound describes these sounds that are below the human hearing range, so below 20 hertz, and is particularly used to describe those that are believed to influence mood and state of mind. Infrasound, specific frequencies of infrasound, have been closely associated with experiences of the supernatural and other sorts of cognitive effects. We go back to that precedence effect of possibly someone being there. When you start to combine effects like infrasound and the precedence effect, it can traditionally be seen very much as if this space has a presence in it, another entity. And in fact, that is something that can be experienced even in the current day, even by someone who is aware of these principles. So how do archaeoacousticians approach sound? And what does this have to do with heritage? Well, the first step in conserving sonic heritage is going to be documentation, whether that's of the sounds of a particular instrument, whether that's the sonic properties of a large space or the acoustic properties of a sonic space. This begins with anecdotal evidence. And to describe anecdotal evidence, I will relate to you an anecdote. I've had the fortune of traveling to Latin America a number of times. These have been uh, very special experiences in my life. And as one does when traveling to Latin America, I visited some of these monumental urban cores of the past, such as the one shown here, which is Oaxaca um, in southern Mexico. So if you've had the, uh, the chance to go to these places, you might have noticed tour guides when they, when they reach open spaces like the plaza shown here, we're actually looking through a series of doorways towards the plaza. But the tour guides will position themselves strategically in the space and then start snapping or clapping. And then they might indicate to their tour group the echoes coming off of the sides of the stone architecture. This is an anecdotal observation of the behavior of sound in this space, and it is the first important clue in taking a more in-depth study. So once we have this sort of anecdotal indication of what's going on, uh, that there is some kind of strong echo, that there is some interesting quality to the sound in this space, of course, we can go down the theoretical side of speculating on who might be making that sound, what their audience might be, where their audience might be. And to address those theoretical considerations, we undertake systematic experiments to quantify the sound, its behavior, and if that's consistent with our postulation. So, Experimental archaeoacoustics is mostly what I do within the subfield of archaeoacoustics. This often requires, um, if we're talking about spaces like, like the one here, actually going there, producing a sound, and recording what happens, then going through and reviewing those recordings. These experiments can be directed in a number of ways. You can produce sound through traditional techniques, such as and clapping, playing traditional instruments. You can also produce sound in uh, more uh, systematic and modernized ways, such as playing back what we would call a, uh, a sinusoidal sweep, which is an artificially generated tone that just goes through the whole of human hearing range and then back down. 
I'm not going to play that for you because it sounds truly terrible, like a slow car alarm with the battery dying. It's, it's awful. <laughs> but you get good data from it. And another way we get data is through predictive approaches, um, taking the dimensions of that space and the sorts of materials that it's made out of, same thing with musical instruments, taking their dimensions and their materials and trying to match that up with particular wavelengths, uh, such as you know the potential resonant wavelengths of a musical instrument of an enclosed space, uh, echo delays, which direction they'd be coming from. But this can get complicated, and so some, well, uh, actually a very select few archaeoacousticians, are expanding into the realm of computational modeling, taking essentially acoustic engineering software, feeding in data they have about how a space looks now, or how it might be reconstructed, and getting some idea of how the sound was, uh, would probably have behaved in the past, given those inputs. And so I've mentioned instruments a couple of times. Here's a couple of drawings from actually my very first excavation, which was in central Honduras, so working with some Mesoamerican materials. These ocarinas fall into the category of wind instruments, which also include such things as horns. And when I say horns, I mean both horns in the classical instrument sense, such as those made out of brass tubing and bells, but also horns in the literal sense of a hollow horn that's been modified on one end to be able to be blown. Of course, shell trumpets operate on very much the same principle. They are very much horns. Flutes, whistles, and ocarinas. So as I said, the examples here are from my experiences excavating in Mesoamerica. In Mesoamerica, we have this category called FUOs. It stands for figurines, whistles, and ocarinas. So here we go. I'm describing these in terms of flutes, whistles, and ocarinas, but we can borrow that Mesoamerican term FUO. And the reason why we call it that is because, especially uh, in the area that I was working, what we find in the archaeological record is musical instruments that are often decorated like people, as you see on the left, or animals, like the monkey you see on the right. And these ornaments can be broken off, so we might find just a face. It looks like maybe it's a figurine, but we don't know. Maybe it's a whistle. If the whistle has multiple chambers or multiple holes to control the sound, then it's an ocarina. So when we're finding fragmentary evidence of flows in Mesoamerica, it's difficult to say what it is, only unless we find an actual complete or near complete object. Of course, percussion instruments, I'm sure I don't have to give any examples. Anything can be a percussion instrument. You know, that just goes without saying. String instruments, uh, you know, of course, we're all familiar with, say, violins. Uh, but there are other string instruments, and we'll, we'll be getting into, actually, on the next slide, an example of a string instrument in its early development. And natural objects can be instruments as well. So ringing rocks, or as they're sometimes called, rock gongs, will have an example of that as well. And lithophones, sometimes used synonymously with rock gongs or ringing rocks, but lithophones is a term that mostly gets applied, uh, such as in the examples of stalagmites in caves being used as musical instruments. In those cases, the stalagmites might not just show signs of being intentionally struck, but might have had sections broken off to change the resonant tone of the stalagmite in order to change the, the tone that it plays. Now, of course, the calculations for that uh, actually get even more complicated because the speed of sound in different materials changes, and so that, depending on the material it's made out of, 
is going to affect the sound as well. Something we should take into account when we're doing computational approaches and something that was probably done more by trial and error when these things were typically used. We should not forget that musical instruments may have served multiple purposes. If any of you have gone to a uh, traditional Pueblo dance or to the more modern incarnation of uh, powwow, you may notice that uh, some of the ornaments might be musical instruments in and of themselves. This is very much true for, say, tortoise shell rattles. And it's important to emphasize that the very first musical instrument is the human voice. So we should also be thinking about the human voice when we're taking approaches to archaeoacoustics. Now I promised some examples, and here are some more examples depicted in the petroglyphs of Mesa Prieta. We have one of our iconic animal flute players, this apparently an armadillo, playing what would no doubt be an end-blown style flute. So if you can imagine blowing on the end of a glass bottle, this is the basic principle on which an end-blown flute works. But these two figures next to the animal flute player also seem to be musical. Our first cue into that is their mouths are open. So this is once again, I said, don't forget that the human voice is the first musical instrument. Here we see indications of people singing. Again, we have other cues that this is music, such as the unambiguous armadillo flute player. But there's another thing that I want to point out in this panel as well. Now these figures are holding bows, and it's not uncommon to see what we call martial imagery, uh, images of weapons used in hunting and in conflict as well as shields. It's not uncommon to see these in traditional dances, but it is interesting that these bows have no arrows. And while they may simply be bows as ornaments, the way that they're being held and the lack of arrows leaves room to interpret these to be music bows. Now the music bow has been independently invented around the globe multiple times, just as the bow itself has. Why do we know that? Well, during the initial peopling of the Americas, as well as the original settlement of Australia and uh, in other places, bows had not been invented by the time the original settlement of these areas occurred. So people arrived without bows and invented them multiple times in Afro-Eurasia, Australia, and the Americas. Virtually everywhere that we see the invention of the bow, we also see some sort of instance of a music bow, essentially beginning to play a bow either like a harp by strumming it with the fingers, or almost like a violin by rubbing it with a stick or the shaft of an arrow. Since we have no arrows here, we might speculate that these bows are being played in the harp way. This is, while not definitive, certainly supported by the uh, faces, uh, the faces with the open mouths singing and the armadillo playing. This panel also prompts questions into what are we interested when we're discussing the uh, archaeoacoustics of uh, instruments in the past and how does that relate to conservation and preservation. Well, one of the most popular topics to investigate when it comes to instruments is tonality. Was there some kind of established tone structure? What are the tones of an individual find? Much like these figurines, whistles, ocarinas that we see in Mesoamerica, uh, we have multi-chambered wind instruments, or, or rather multi-key wind instruments, even though it's really a single chamber for the flute uh, depicted here. 
but we're still interested in where those are positioned. What are the dimensions of the flute? Is there any kind of standardization? Even without that standardization, what are the tones of the individual instruments? Now for Mesa Prieta, that's somewhat speculative because while we have ample depictions of flutes in the iconography, we actually have yet to find a preserved example. This is probably because they're made of perishable materials and have since decayed away. In other regions, we have found flutes made out of more durable materials, such as ceramic and bone. And in those instances, some folks will uh, take interest by measuring the dimensions and the positions of the holes to uh, try a computational approach to figuring out the tones that these might have played when instruments are preserved well enough and when there is permission from the uh, from the rightful owners of that cultural heritage depending on your jurisdiction it might be the national government it might be a local government it might be a tribal entity it might be an individual private landowner depending on if you're able to get permission some folks are able to play these I have had the fortune to play a thousand year old ocarina. And so that's where we can go from computational to back to experimental approaches to investigate things like the tonality of the individual instrument and the tonality of a collection of instruments. Same can be said for music bows, but again, this is going to be very speculative because music bows are inherently made out of perishable materials and the tones of a music bow are, even if the bow itself is preserved, the tones are not going to be because the wooden material will ha of the uh, bow itself is going to have undergone a certain level of dehydration and decay. Uh, the, the cordage used will not necessarily be taut and the amount of tension, of course, is going to change the tone. However, in theory, it still is an avenue that can be investigated. One of the approaches might be an experimental reproduction, and by making a large set of experimental reproduction music bows with traditional materials, trying to get the dimensions as true as possible to the past and then playing with tension one might be able to extrapolate a range. I mentioned another type of instrument is ringing rocks. This is the utilization of natural materials to make a sound. Here we have an example from the Death Valley National Park and the slope that these petroglyphs are on is absurd. Every single one of those tablets of stone has, uh, has a sound somewhat like this. In other words, they've got a metallic ringing sound because this stone, while originally sedimentary, was at some point subducted and metamorphosed under extreme temperature and pressure before being uplifted again back up into a mountain range. This process of metamorphosis of the stone has uh, yielded these very compact, very flat surfaces that are uh, either full of natural glasses or more likely of metal rich deposits that give the stone that metallic ringing quality. It should be no surprise then that we see petroglyphs such as these on outcrops of rocks in this area. There were also petroglyphs on some of the tabular stone. So what seems to be happening is that people have recognized that these are instruments and produced the petroglyphs using a pecking technique, which is a necessarily percussive technique stone striking stone to draw images on a, a sonically significant stone. We have examples also from Mesa Prieta. 
And now, uh, this video is a few years old. It does predate me. But what you see here is a boulder with a petroglyph on it, with actually probably several petroglyphs and a significant amount of battering on one edge. Experiments uh, verified the speculation about the origins or the purpose of this sort of battering on the edge that has resulted in the obliteration of the petroglyphs. We're going to play that again for you here. Do some more. So this is something that we don't do anymore. We don't strike the surface with stones anymore. But this experiment is actually important in what it reveals. And this is verification of the ringing rocks. We continue to find more ringing rocks on Mesa Prieta. In fact, our uh, summer youth program documented at least one very clear ringing rock with a petroglyph on it this summer. Aside from instruments, another thing that we're interested in is place and space. So I'm taking you back to our ruins just outside of the city of Oaxaca to discuss the structure of space. Archaeoacousticians will often study how the characteristics, the form, shape, materials of a place affect the qualities of how sound is reflected and how it is perceived. Imagine, if you will, a person standing on this raised platform in the middle of the plaza, right back here. A person standing there is going to have quite a large audience, but it's going to be directional. In other words, they'll have to turn their backs to someone on one side of the plaza or another. Now imagine someone standing on the top of this platform. They will have an audience that is potentially this entire plaza space and will likely be audible to almost everyone in this plaza space, assuming that they project their voices uh, and, and So this is one of the considerations that we think about is how does the arrangement of space not only affect the sound, but where the audibility is and what are the social implications of that. So we can make inferences about the purposes of these various structures. What is more appropriate for delivering a speech or song or other sort of audible cue to a larger audience. There's active research going on right now in uh, South America about, about this interplay between leadership and audiences in large public spaces like plazas. So I would suggest, um, if you're interested in learning more about that, reading uh, some of the recent works by Miriam Kohler. The idea, if I'm to summarize it here, is that even small audio cues can be used to orchestrate labor and to organize events, but the structure of space, whether it is a constructed space like you're seeing or a natural space, plays an important factor in the separation of the leadership and those communicating the directions versus those performing the actions 
that are cued by whatever the whatever the sound is. This ties into the broader concept of soundscapes, which broadly speaking could be anywhere. You know, it's just the term soundscapes really describes considering how sound plays on a landscape scale. A subset of the idea of soundscapes is the idea of sound sheds, and that is an area of interaudibility. In other words, an area where a person in one spot can communicate with a person in the other spot. That's what I'm trying to illustrate by these examples of the use of a plaza space, and that's very much what works by folks like Miriam Kohler address. We're interested, of course, in how architectural constructions change the perception of sound, might have been used intentionally to direct sound. So examples of this could be plazas, kivas, temples, Neolithic barrows, as well as how natural spaces might be utilized in a similar way. I'll be playing for you some examples from Mesa Prieta regarding that. But before we get to that, there's another natural landform that I'd like to talk about, which is singing sand tunes. And to recount this, I'm going to read back uh, an excerpt from a 2019 presentation that I gave in Bern, Switzerland, during the European Association of Archaeologists annual meeting. Sizable sand dunes are striking features of several deserts across the world. Eddies in seasonal and prevailing winds, especially near the leeward slopes of mountain ranges, sustain stable dunes that occupy the same space for centuries to several millennia. Extreme heat and dryness create conditions for cascading sand slides to generate remarkably loud noise. Notably, 30 total booming or squeaking dunes are known throughout the world, including in Algeria, Chile, northern China, Namibia, and Qatar, with North America's Great Basin hosting a disproportionately high number of these dunes. Now, in North America's Great Basin, several booming dunes are ethnographically known. These today can be named as Big Dune in the Amargosa Desert, Eureka Dunes in Death Valley, Sand Mountain in Central Nevada, and Dumont and Kelso Dunes in the Mojave Desert. Reaching up to 100 meters above the valley floor, these towering sand dunes generate strong rumbles, often with up to five or more harmonic overtones, so there's that resonance again, when cascades of sound tumble, or rather when cascades of sand tumble down the dunes leeward slopes, producing sound. So the sand tumbles producing the sound, we don't have tumbling sound producing sand, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Uh, as the mechanism appears to involve friction between cascading sheets of sand with specific grain attributes, extremely dry conditions are required. Big Dune, one of the examples given, and its regional counterparts were conceived of as active participants in communal gatherings. In this manner, their role was seen similar to that of an orator or song leader, uh, which were social roles that were central to the organization of multi-band feasts, communal hunts, and the reification of identity, as well as in facilitating trade. Now, why dunes are important to sonic heritage can again be exemplified by Big Dune. Culturally significant sound should be considered in the development of management plans. And in the case of Big Dune, Tribal consultation revealed exactly why. Tribal representatives and archaeologists successfully argued for a proposed solar array that was originally to be placed at the foot of Big Dune to be relocated to a different portion of that desert, several miles away, due to its potential to disrupt the environment that supports Big Dune. Both the viewshed the natural environment, but also because the installation of solar panels could have disrupted the air currents that allow Big Dune itself to form. This is an example of a success in conserving sonic heritage. And we will get to some examples of more complicated uh, 
more complicated examples of the tension between conservation and development when it comes to Sonic heritage. I also want to discuss box canyons because these are also enclosed spaces and this is where I have done most of my acoustical research previously. Here we see a view out of a box canyon in, in the Mojave Desert, one of my former real research locations. But to best describe these, I think a little video is in order. So this is a virtual tour from a 3D reconstruction, and you will be hearing sound accompanying this. The sounds that you will hear are a uh, musical composition made with a little bit of artistic license from the measured resonant tones in the space that is being modeled. Now, I do apologize. Uh, in order to be able to include this in the presentation, I had to drop the quality down. So this won't be true HD quality, which means that it's going to be difficult to discern some of the petroglyphs. But this room is loaded with petroglyphs. So that's a bit of how we can conserve sonic heritage, is we can create virtual environments in which we generate sound, in which we take a computational approach based on experimental data. And this can be particularly useful in preserving the spaces by preventing people from visiting. I want to, before we dive into the archaeoacoustics at Mesa Prieta, uh, reference European up, Upper Paleolithic caves, because you may well have heard that caves like Chauvet and others have been closed to the public for quite some time. And yet the public still gets to visit, but they visit a reconstruction. These reconstructions can become much more accurate uh, now that we have full digital 3D modeling techniques. And in fact, we can use immersive experiences like VR to present these spaces without actually physically taking people into spots that might actually be delicate both for their cultural significance as well as their ecology. So I do want to talk about the acoustics at Mesa Prieta. And I've prepared a couple of short video clips filmed in the field with uh, a few slides of images to go with each one. We'll give you a little bit more idea of what we've got to offer. So I'm standing here on a rather important part of the mesa, but an area that you may not normally get to see as it's not included in our regular tours. This area has one of our denser concentrations of petroglyphs and some really fantastic images, very meticulously executed, some of them very large in scale, such as the very large two-horned serpent behind me. But this area is also important for other reasons one of which may likely be its acoustical properties. See, this spot has very strong echoes.
And in fact, it probably had stronger echoes in the past. We're in an area sort of at the top of a little canyon running up the side of the mesa. So this canyon has walls that reflect sound inwardly. Right here, where the petroglyphs get very dense, we have little lobes where the canyon widens and then narrows back down at the end. This creates a natural amphitheater effect. However, this natural amphitheater is not in the condition that it originally was when the uh, ancestors of Tewa peoples made these petroglyphs back here. Behind the camera, behind me, is a large scar from mining activities that happened in the 1990s. This changed the shape of the head of this little canyon and impacts the amount by which the echoes are reflected in between the walls and also increases the delay of the echo coming back. Now why would this be important? Why is it worth noting that the echoes have changed? Well, because given the qualities of this space, we do still get very strong echoes. I can walk off camera and demonstrate. So a little bit of what you're seeing here are some of the images that I just described in the video clip. So we're once again in a part of the Mesa that many of you watching this video probably haven't seen as, again, this is another area that we don't normally operate tours in. We are getting on a position from the, the Rio Grande to the rim. We're starting to get higher up on the Mesa here, but we are inside of a little alcove. Why is that important? Well. Much as we saw with the previous location, we have facing walls of rock uh, that allow sound to be reflected back and forth. So of course, you're seeing the base of one of these walls of rock right here behind me, including this boulder on which has a petroglyph we're about to talk about. But also, just behind the camera, there's another rock wall that faces back this direction. So again, similar to the other area that uh, I've taken you to now via video, uh, we're in a position where sound can be produced on one side and then echoed back and forth between the different sides of the alcove. Additionally, there is just out of frame a gully on the other side of this rock wall that merges into this alcove that we're in as a sort of tributary. That gully has another wall uh, on the opposite side of the one behind me that goes up further. This allows sound to reflect off of the wall behind me, off of the wall behind the camera, and off of that wall behind the camera to the, to the gully, to the back wall of the gully, and then back again creates a very complex interplay of sound uh, that ultimately has, albeit 
very quiet by the time you get that, that third echo, a sort of time delay between the sound produced here and it coming back once again off the back of the gully. These are the sorts of considerations that we like to make when we're looking at the landscape level of archaeoacoustics, and especially when we're in these places that are mostly naturally shaped, but heavily culturally utilized. So I want to talk about this petroglyph for a moment. Here is a flute player image that oh, we'll be editing in a uh, zoomed in version for this uh, talk, to, uh, this portion about talking about it. But that gives us an indication that we are in a place that is acoustically significant. We have a person playing a musical instrument depicted in the iconography here. Also an interesting parallel between the uh, that canyon that I took you to previously and where we are now is here is another two-horned serpent. Not as large as the one featured before, but still very meticulously executed with uh, substantial infilling of the pecking as well as apparent eyes. So there's a lot of time and attention to detail. As I've previously mentioned, the actual act of producing the petroglyphs itself could potentially be an inherently musical process. The flute player behind me and the two-horned serpent are made with that same pecking technique that I previously described. So again, this gives a sort of percussive quality that uh, can be added to whatever else is going on in this area. Imagine then the sound of striking this surface. And as the rhythm is picked up, once again, we have these sound reflections that are close enough together to create a sort of confusion between the initial sound and the echo returning. This sort of interplay, uh, one, can give the effect of reverberation, which has any number of psychoacoustic effects that I will also talk about in this video, but it also has certain qualitative properties. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to quantify, but then when you get these echoes going back and forth, Say we're not talking about percussion. Say we're talking about singing and lyrics to a song. With these echoes coming from different distances, you might then begin to perceive the lyrics arriving out of order, as if they're being sung in not the order that they're actually being sung in. I've observed this quality at other petroglyph sites too, which I'll be talking about as well. But uh, this should be noted, even if just qualitatively, because this is very much a part of the experience, the phenomenology of the place. It is also a part of the interaction with sound that makes the process of interacting with sound discursive. In other words, it is like discourse, it is like an exchange, it is, in a way, like having a conversation. So when we see figures like this flute player back here, we might consider them to be in the act of discourse with the echoes coming from other aspects of this space, coming from other parts of this space.
that many of you might be familiar with. We call this part of the uh, Mesa and of the Wales Petroglyph Preserve Flute Player Hollow. Many of you may have been fortunate enough to have had a tour through this area already. So some of this might be review. Now Flute Player Hollow is different from some of the other areas we'll be looking at. It's very sheltered, so this space blocks off a lot of the wind. So today's actually a fairly windy day, but we're only getting a gentle breeze in here. Flute Player Hollow is also very aptly named. We have numerous flute player images here, including of humans, animals, and possible animal humans, or therianthropic figures, as they might be referred to in the literature. Where I'm sitting right now, we have numerous images of, uh, say, ceremonial figures. There's a person wearing a bighorn sheep headdress here. But of course, what we'll be focusing on are the flute player images. There are two very clear ones right back here. Another possible one just to this side. And then further across the hollow, going this way, we've got one just on the, uh, just outside of the frame of shot, but facing the opposite direction. So you wouldn't be able to see it from here. Uh, several more on that, on that hillside, in fact. Uh, making this part of the Wells Preserve the largest concentration or densest concentration of flute player images that we have. We do find these all across the Mesa, but they are most common here. So why here? Well, for one, we're in an enclosed area, so we have walls facing each other. Good echoes. Uh, we have echoes coming from uh, further over this way where uh, it opens up a little bit, and uh, there are several flute player images among the boulders on one side of two facing walls. So like other areas that we talk about in this video, these two facing walls create the opportunity for sound reflections to bounce back and forth. Now where we're set up is an even more enclosed space with the walls that are much closer together. So this creates the opportunity for other acoustic effects that we might not find commonly here on the Mesa. Now studies are still ongoing, so we can't say anything definitive about this area. However, based on prior experience and a rudimentary idea of the proportions of this space that we're in, we have the potential for there to be acoustical resonance. In other words, the space that you see behind me, the one where the flute players are, is not only a place where sound is going to echo, but there are enough relatively smooth, relatively vertical surfaces facing each other, enclosing a space that is neither too small nor too large to have resonant tones that are in the human hearing range. Now when I say resonant tones, the uh, physics behind this is basically that for any given space, there are a set of wavelengths that will repeat an even number of times within that space. Now, that uh, even number of times is uh, rather important. And when I say repeat within that space, I mean Say you, have, say you have a sound with a, uh, about, we're, we're going to say the, near the low end of uh, human hearing, which is about 20 hertz, depending on the conditions, the temperature, the air pressure, the elevation, that 20 hertz can be represented as, as, as a waveform, which a, a, it will have a specific wavelength that is equal to a specific distance. So when a space has that particular distance in it, um, then it will 
increase the apparent volume of anything, of any sound wave that is 20 hertz or a multiple of 20 hertz. What we have in this space here is a space of comparable proportions to ones that I've studied elsewhere, comparable smoothness and surface, so we can speculate that it might be worth doing acoustical experiments in this place to see if there are indeed resonant tones in here, especially ones in the human, in the human auditory range and in the human vocal range. I would say that that's quite likely. And we have, again, iconography that would indicate that. We have a couple of flute players, flute players rather, in very close proximity to each other. So that indicates that there is something going on with sound in this space. Now, speculation on resonance aside, there's something else going on with flute player hollow too. And that is that, as I mentioned uh, previously, this is a very enclosed space. And despite the fact that today is a very windy day, as you'll see from my uh, clip taken at the top of the mesa, uh, that despite the fact that this is a windy day, there's not much wind here in Flute Player Hollow. Now, this could be very important to these Flute Player images, as it's very difficult to be able to hear the flute on a windy day. Pueblo flutes are what we call an end-blown style flute, which, uh, if you've ever blown on the end of a glass bottle, go, ooh, there you go. Um, that's the principle of a wind-blown flute. Add a few holes in it for, for keys, and you'll be able to tune it. Um, so Pueblo flutes are also end-blown flutes. Uh, this extra complicates uh, playing it in, uh, in windy conditions. And uh, even if the player is able to overcome the wind or, or shield the wind so that they can get a consistent airflow across the edge to actually produce the sound, the wind is going to drown out that sound. These flutes may sound very clear, but can actually be exceptionally quiet against the background sound, especially the wind and as it rushes through the foliage, such as the foliage that we have surrounding us. So this is an area that was sheltered, that it would have been easier to hear the flutes play, and uh, an area where the echoes would have improved the sound quality, improved the audibility, and on which we can also speculate that there might have been acoustic resonance, uh, at least in this little alcove, this lobe on the side of uh, Flute Player Hollow. Um, aside from that, I touched on in one of the other areas shown that the uh, act of uh, playing some kind of, uh, some sort of musical instrument, whether it be flute, whether it be packing the petroglyphs itself, and interacting with the echoes is a discursive process. It's like a conversation. A good analogy would be listening to jazz players. If, if you listen to a jazz band, uh, you might note that as, as much as there's improvisation going on, it's not wholly unstructured that uh, each musician is riffing on the things that their bandmates are doing. Uh, in a similar way, we can discuss the significance of flute players in a place with strong echoes and possible other acoustical properties uh, in, in that same light, that the echoes of the sound that's being played or of the percussive sound what, from the petroglyphs, rather, from the petroglyphs being made, um, or from the sound of people singing, all this uh, creates the opportunity for the echoing surfaces and the echoes coming off of them to act like other members of that band. Um, if we're to go back to the uh, jazz analogy, those echoes become other bandmates to riff off of. So this um, 
this is why we call it a discursive process, because it's sort of conversational. The musicians have the opportunity, at least, to sort of hold a conversation with the echoes coming from back there, with the echoes coming from over there, and with the ones that have bounced back and forth a few times. This uh, creates further opportunity for uh, sort of improvisation and playfulness, uh, which we should not discount as a possible motivation for uh, people utilizing the acoustical properties of a particular space, especially when we're talking about natural spaces like this. Apologies, I don't have a wind windscreen adequate enough to uh, keep the wind from blowing out the microphone on the camera right now, but I think you'll still be able to hear me. We're at the top of the mesa now. Behind me is a vertical rock wall of our capstone basalt, at the very top of which, at the top of the frame that you're seeing, is the rim of the mesa itself. Rock walls like this serve a number of acoustical purposes. Of course, a fantastic echo. But it's not just the echoes of who's at the foot of the wall that are important. You see, when we get walls like this, there is a slight curvature, a uh, parabolic indentation. You can get what we call a whisper gallery. Now, a whisper gallery collects sound. Think like a satellite dish collects uh, the radio waves from satellites. Similarly, a parabolic shape in the rock wall can act as a collecting point to focus sound so that a person standing in the right position at the focal point of a slightly, even so slightly parabolic shape in the wall will be able to hear very clearly things happening quite a distance away. This being at the top of the mesa, the area that can reflect sound off of this wall is absolutely immense. So these can be useful for observing what is going on. In this instance, we're listening in on what's going down, going on down in the river valley below us. Now, you may wonder. What does this have to do with petroglyphs? Well, to my right, on a boulder on this slope of boulders, right next to the rock wall, is our uh, friendly two-horned serpent who's been following us throughout these shots. If you wanted confirmation that uh, native peoples, Pueblo peoples were here, and utilized this spot, there it is.
So the examples given, of course, extend beyond our uh, normal area covered by tours, as I mentioned. But they also give, uh, they also act as good examples of both uh, successes and challenges towards preserving sonic heritage, towards preserving these uh, acoustical qualities of places and things. Like I mentioned, flutes are perishable, music bows are perishable, but also development can significantly impact these places and oftentimes reconstruction is not enough. When you're talking about as complex of a landform as the boulder-strewn escarpment of Mesa Prieta, without prior significant documentation on a level that wasn't even available at the time, there's no way to reconstruct the behavior of the sound. There are folks attempting to do some things. I'm thinking particularly of uh, Angela Bellia, who is working with Roman period sites in Italy, but the structures that uh, Dr. Bellia is working with are much simpler. They've got fewer faces and there are, uh, yeah, there are only so many questions that can be answered with these sorts of reconstructions. And again, once we lose the ability to do the experimental side of things. Uh, not only is there a significant amount of data lost or data potential lost, uh, but it can be difficult or impossible to reconstruct. Mesa Prieta is by far not the only place impacted. And in fact, most well-known popular archeological sites are. What you're seeing here is a picture of Monk's Mound, which is the largest earthen pyramid in North America. This is located at Cahokia, which is a site that was occupied between about 1050 and 1250 AD, just outside of St. Louis, St. Louis, St. Louis, on the Illinois side of the, uh, of the river. In fact, you can even see the, uh, the, St. Louis Arch, uh, or St. Louis Arch from here. But this site is actually significantly impacted despite being a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Because on the local level, it's been managed at no higher level than a county park for a long time and was almost bulldozed to make room for a freeway. In fact, there is a highway that runs right through the core of the site between these large earthen platforms. And when I say large, look, look, look at these, these little dots. These are people. This is huge. This is one of the largest monumental centers in uh, pre-contact North America. And yet it has been significantly impacted by highways. Those highways affect the quality of sound. It is very difficult to do an acoustic study at this place anymore, despite the fact that we have large buildings with wide open sound sheds and vast open plazas, but to be able to do experimental uh, techniques, experimental approaches to studying the sound in these places, well, it's always going to receive interference from the highway going through the core and the freeway going just north of the core. So these are considerations that we should be thinking about with places and spaces. And it is often easier to conserve instruments if we, if we find an object, you know, there are, there are conservatives experienced in maintaining the materials of those objects. But then we also have to think about stewardship of those objects. Who are the rightful stewards and how can these be 
presented in a way that remains respectful to the cultures from which they came. Too often these things can become the objects of cultural appropriation, taken out of their context, put on display in ways that are disrespectful, and so we want to avoid doing that as well. And then, ultimately, we want to identify these places before they become too significantly impacted so that we can make proper management decisions about how a space is to be approached, about how an object should be conserved before it becomes damaged or contaminated. If you were interested in any of the things that I said today, here is a um, incomplete bibliography of some of the references that I used. So feel free to write these down, pause the video, screen cap this. We've in fact got two slides of that. So yeah, um, but take note, these are great springboards for getting it more into archaeoacoustics and some of the cultures uh, whose cultural heritage we've covered here too. And I want to thank you all once again for tuning in and um, have, a, have a wonderful summer and have a musical summer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ethan. It's been my pleasure. Well, um, short answer is no. Uh, I did a little bit of scan of, of the literature, uh, particularly around feasting and uh, other sorts of large communal events, the sorts of contexts where we would expect to find these. And I haven't seen any specific mentions. The long answer is that this doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't been encountered, that they don't exist in the area. Um, that they weren't used in the past or in present day rituals. Uh, it simply means that they uh, were more recorded as a part of field notes documentation, but were left out of the reports on these things. Um, I'm also, I did my previous research in the Great Basin and the Mojave Desert, um, before that Hawaii and Mesoamerica, the point being is that I focused on a number of other cultural areas, but I'm still fairly new to the Southwest. I've only been working in the Southwest uh, really consistently for a year and, and sort of on and off prior to that. So, um, you know, I'll just fully admit that there could be a gap in my own knowledge uh, and these might have been documented, reported and published and I might simply not be aware of uh, of those publications. I do know that there are more whistle type objects. So of course we have these depictions of uh, of flutes. Uh, we presume end blown flutes and the petroglyphs, uh, but we're also not far from the influence of the plains where we have uh, a flute that operates more like a recorder. If anyone remembers like fifth grade music class. Um, and of course the uh, the, the Tewa Pueblos, especially Oke Awenge, almost border on the lands of the Tewa Pueblos like uh, Picturis and Taos. 
and they definitely had contact with the plains and had these other style of uh, of flutes. And the simpler versions of the flutes, and there are sort of traditional ones that are shorter, are more whistle-like. Uh, so that's starting to get into the realm of something more like an ocarina, but then that's not necessarily made out of pottery. Uh, especially more modern ones tend to uh, tend to be made out of, um, at least what I'm seeing, out of more perishable materials, out of wood, uh, largely. Again, especially when it comes to the modern ones, uh, we can't. I can't say for sure that they that they don't exist. I'm just not aware of them at the moment. Absolutely. Thank you, Paula. Um, and Ethan, that's an interesting point about using uh, flakes and debitage as tinklers. Um, this can often look like just a, a lithic scatter in the record because, um, say, if these were attached to uh, any sort of apparel, like I mentioned in the talk, that musical instruments can serve uh, another function and can become a part of ornament or apparel. Um, but this might even be archaeologically invisible, and they just appear to be from the uh, the, the reduction of the uh, the stone tools. Um, there do seem to be some locations. Uh, I'm aware of at least one site in uh, southeastern Oregon where the locations of lithic reduction sites seem to be placed specifically because of uh, their relationship with sound. Uh, there is a, uh, sorry, excuse if you can hear the sirens in the background. Um, well, I was talking about this site in Oregon where there are lithic scatters on opposite sides of a lake, both 90 degrees from a rock wall. Uh, and so this rock wall with petroglyphs on it seems to be reflecting sound from when people were reducing the uh, the the tool stone into stone tools, uh, as well as um, anyone who's been sailing on a calm day will know that a flat surface of water can also reflect sound. So, yeah, I mean, that that would be an example of uh, evidence towards sort of what you're talking about of um, these these stone flakes uh, and and. Uh, stone debitage being used as a musical instrument as well. And like I said, if you string that up, there might be no evidence of that once that string decays. This is something that we see with um, with pendant stones in the Great Basin. Sometimes they're called charm stones. Uh, we tend to reserve the word pendant for ones with a drill hole through it, but even without the drill holes, they were secured to everything from cradle boards to costuming and they have these intricate designs on them, and they would have made a tinkling sound when they were strung up. But, you know, very much like uh, if you were to take the uh, stone debitage, string it up, and then the string decays. Once the, uh, the string or the fabric around it decays, or once it just falls out of place, there's really no evidence left on it that shows that, that use. So it can remain speculative, but um, I do think that there are lines of evidence that this is something that's happening. Um, good question, Lorraine. I have not yet uh, undertaken thorough en enough of studies of Mesa Prieta to be absolutely certain, but just from just from a general idea of the landscape, there really ought to be, and they may well be associated with some of these acoustically significant spaces. Uh, we need to do experiments to uh, to determine that. Um, 
at other places I've worked, uh, this is definitely this is definitely a thing. So uh, for the audience, the concept that Lorraine is asking about, we sometimes refer to as sound sheds, uh, the area over which sound is conducted. At some of the uh, the box canyons I've done previously, there are multiple internal sound sheds, and that's because the canyon might kind of cut back and forth, you know, do little uh, do little jigs and jogs, and um, and and while while it's doing jigs and jogs from left to right, it's also doing this going up. Um, so you'll have more of a, a, a slope or vertical wall and then a relatively horizontal area and then another slope or vertical wall and repeat that. And so these these changes in direction, both vertically and horizontally, end up creating these sorts of shout, sound shadows that Lorraine is asking about. And when, uh, at, at least in my, my experience, and I think I need to, to build a bigger sample size uh, of, of sites that have been studied to be sure, but it does seem that different sound sheds within an, a single petroglyph site will end up having different iconography. So one sound shed um, I'm just going to use an example. Um, at uh, one slot canyon that I worked in, there were three distinct sound sheds. One included the lower section of the canyon, the lower third of the canyon, and an area extending out from the canyon uh, at least about half a kilometer to another site with a rock shelter on it. And all this was one sound shed. So if you make a sound at the rock shelter or in the canyon, you can hear one from the other, at least from the lower third of the canyon to the shelter and vice versa. The iconography in this sound shed had a lot to do with hunting images. When you get to the next sound shed, so the, as you're going into the canyon, there's a corner that you turn and then it just goes quiet. You can't hear anything from the previous sound shed. You're suddenly in a very different space and the iconography changes drastically. Um, and uh, so the, the hunting images start to go away. We get a lot more images of mythology and astronomy. And uh, and then there's a third sound shed. And those images in the third sound shed are, um, they take on yet another character. Uh, so, yeah, very good question, Lorraine. Um, as I said, uh, I haven't thoroughly studied Mesa Prieta enough to know exactly where those acoustic shadows are, but we would expect them to be there, and they probably were significant. Um, uh, if and when we find them, then it'll be time to examine if there's uh, differences in the iconography between these different sound sheds and what that might imply about how these spaces are used, what sort of significance, symbolic significance they had, and uh, yeah. And, uh, of course, our uh, management decisions moving forward from that as well. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. So, so I guess, guess uh, people, so I guess, uh, people are, are having a hard time hearing you, but hopefully, uh, they, but hopefully can hear the uh, they can hear the questions now. being asked now. Um, so, so going, going on, on to the so next question, on to the next question, uh, well, more of a comment, uh, well, more Amy, of a comment Crane says Amy Crane that Crane says that she votes for Chester, Chester, to, have Chester, Chester to have his own show, or show, 60 second, or 60 educational, second educational day. She's hooked, and she says you make it look so engaging and easy to understand. Thank you, Amy. Um, I do at least have a, a monthly show right now, uh, the uh, monthly chat with the archaeologist, which is on the second Friday of every month. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I like the suggestion. I'm still getting used to the to producing all this content. Um, this is my uh, second of three talks all within two weeks of each other. Uh, so over a, over a, about a four week period I'm doing. Uh, you know, starting with one talk, now we're in the middle. I've got one more in, in a little under two weeks. So um, we'll, we'll see how I handle like every other week uh, before uh, expanding into weekly. But yeah, I, li I like the way you think. 
Uh, Amy continues on to say, uh, she asks a question. Uh, she, asks a question. Uh, she says, you might have mentioned this, and I missed it. What other tools do you use besides clapping, singing, or other instruments to measure in various soundscapes? Okay, so, um, yeah, clapping, uh, clapping, singing, snapping uh, can give a general idea, but it's not a very consistent source of sound. Uh, so some early archaeoacoustic studies uh, came under some criticism because no two claps are exactly the same. Um, so there's a team working out of Barcelona that they use balloons. So they infl inflate a bunch of balloons to the same size and then pop them. Um, that's one solution to get a consistent sound. Uh, previously, I've used um, stone on stone percussion. So I'll... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring to the site a tablet of stone that is as close of a match as I can find to the substrate that the petroglyphs are on. And then I'll use culturally appropriate materials, which I think will, will answer another one of the questions we had too, um, to uh, uh, percuss that, that tablet of stone. Um, and those percussors, we think that at Mesa Prieta, some of them were granite, but other ones were quartz, and quartz would be more consistent with what we're seeing broadly across Western North America. There's a certain symbolic importance to the use of quartz. It has a quality called triboluminescence, uh, which is a result of its piezoelectric field. Throwing a bunch of jargon out at you. Um, what this means is that quartz is a crystal, right? And in that crystal lattice, uh, you will uh, you will eventually trap energy. Um, this will get stored in, as, uh, as photons uh, when electrons become dislodged from their orbits. And that, that photon gets stuck in the crystal lattice and can't release to let the electron drop down to a, its lower energy state until you actually strike the quartz and break the crystal lattice. The other way to do this is to heat it, to expand it to the point that the crystal lattice reacts that's we use that for uh, a dating technique called uh, thermoluminescence. But um, in in past uses of the quartz, especially to to make the petroglyphs, uh, they were using quartz because when they would strike the surface, it would cause these microscopic fissures in the quartz, or sometimes break off a whole chunk, and that causes the quartz to flash as the crystal lattice relaxes or is broken, releasing the uh, the energy stored in the electrons as photons as visible light and allowing the electrons to drop down to their lower energy state. Uh, this flash would have, uh, in, in a lot of Native American cultures, been uh, seen as a connection to lightning. And so the sound of producing the petroglyphs is connected to the sound of thunder. And now you've got your lightning, so you've got thunder and lightning. Uh, so there was a uh, deep religious symbolism involved in uh, in using quartz to make petroglyphs. So <laughs> to get back to the, uh, the question at hand, uh, it, it was uh, what other tools do I use? So I was just describing using, I, I would use quartz impactors to, or quartz hammer and chisel stones on uh, a tabular piece of stone similar to the substrate that the petroglyphs are on to make this sound. And um, that would be one source that I've used. I also use uh, what are called sinusoidal sweeps. So this is an artificially generated sound. I, uh, I just generate it on my computer, save it as a sound file. Um, you can save it as an MP3, but that's not good quality. You want to save it as a uh, lossless FLAC or, or a similar format. Wave format would work. Um, you, you, you just want to make sure that you have a, a nice, clean, clear, uncompressed sound uh, sound file of this artificially generated sound that is essentially, if you think about the simplest sound waves, as a sinusoidal wave. It, it, it One cycle is just a curve. Uh, my voice is not a sinusoidal wave. A sinusoidal wave sounds very mechanical because there's not nothing really natural that produces a pure sinusoidal wave or at least not, you know, on the surface of the earth producing sound waves. But uh, this allows us to we we can start we can start with the sinusoidal rain, uh, wave at the low end of the human hearing range, and then play it through the sound file, shortening that wavelength, increasing the frequency, increasing the pitch of the tone, and sweep all the way 
whether you want to go through the human vocal range, through the audible range, whether you want to pick out some other range so you can tune it for, you know, if a flute plays within a certain range of frequencies, you can tune it for those flute frequencies. But it's it's good practice to just sweep all the way through and then back down. And then, then you get your sound response at the entire um the entire range uh, uh, of your auditory range. And this is kind of important because a space can be kind of acoustically dead at some frequencies, but very, very lively with the way that it reflects sound at other tones. And so when you do the sinusoidal sweep, playing it back through, you just need to get a full spectrum speaker. Uh, to any speaker uh, that, you know, could respond to, to sound for the entire human vocal range. Um, yeah, uh, so you play it back through this, you can get a, a response of the space in all these ranges. And I have noticed that some of the spaces I've studied r respond better in particular ranges. Some spaces, say, in the male vocal range, others in the female vocal range. Um, and, and, and so these are some of the qualities of sound that, that we're sort of looking for. But we can represent it in a metric way because we're doing a more sophisticated approach than, you know, my favorite of, of banging rocks together um, that uh, that gives you the, this broad spectrum response. I do want to mention one other way that we get uh, responses for percussion devices, uh, or for percussion sounds. So I say I was banging rocks together. There is a device, and in fact, I have one, but I... Uh, out of respect for the intellectual property of the inventor, I'm not going to show it on camera. Uh, we sometimes call this the Waller device. Now, this was uh, contrived by the uh, archaeoacoustician Stephen Waller. Uh, he, he's brought attention to this topic in North America. And it is a device that can produce a... It is a mechanical device that produces a very consistent percussive sound. Um, much more consistent than me clanging rocks together, clapping, snapping, possibly as consistent or even more consistent than popping balloons. Um, I do have one of these Waller devices, but as I said, uh, I'll have to leave the mystery of uh, how it's constructed to your imagination. So, um, awesome. So, awesome. So, uh, so the next question, I hope everyone, question, can, I hope everyone can, hear can, uh, can uh, hear now. Uh, we had, we had a question asking about Ocarina's, asking about uh, what they're made out of and what they are. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so the examples that I gave in my slides were, uh, those were made out of clay. Uh, they were, fired clay pottery. Um, the way that they made them is actually very interesting. And um, I don't have a link to the article. There is an article that I, I did illustrations for of the process of making them. Essentially, you take, uh, you take a, a ball of something about the size that you want the, the inside of your chamber to be. You lay the clay around it, cut around it, take the two halves off, take the, the ball out, and then and then put them back together. Uh, so the when they were, at, at least when um, when the uh, Lenka ethno-linguistic group in Honduras was making these during what we call the classic period, um, so this would be about the same time that uh, most of my monumental centers were being built, to give you an idea of the time, um, that... Uh, so they would do this and then put these multiple chambers together. So, so, so you have your two halves, you use, use a pokey stick to, to put a little hole in it, and then you attach it to another one and attach it to another one. And, and often you get like anywhere from one to three lobes or chambers on your ocarina, and then they stick the, the, the figure, which is cast in a mold on that and then the mouthpiece on the back end. So from the front, it looks like a figure. And then from the back, it's all like lumpy spheres and um, really interesting. So yeah, most ocarinas that I see are made out of clay. They're not all made in this, uh, they're not all made in this way. But 
Um, yeah, yeah. Usually made out of clay. Oh, you can have a little whistle in there too. So some of them, were, we have evidence that, you know, that in some areas they stuck, stuck a little like stone or shell or something to rattle around inside, much in the way of like, you know, a safety whistle has that, has a little, little thing to rattle around inside. So when you're blowing it, it's not just a, a straight tone, but it kind of, you know, varies. I've probably got one over here, but um, I'm not going to play it for you. I'll just blow out the mic trying to do that. Okay. So Chester, okay. it seems like so for some reason, reason like for some they're having a hard time they're hearing me. Time hearing so what me. I'm going to do is so I'm going to go ahead and post, post, the, ahead question and post the question inside of, inside the, of chat. the chat here okay. on, here uh, on uh, the, the Jitsi. So here's the next so question. So here's the next question. All right. Hold on a sec. Okay, the, uh, the next question, so I've got uh, Judith Williams, right? So it'll be the last uh, one. So it'll be the last okay. one. Okay, last one. Uh, where did the main population live? Did they travel to the Mesa specifically to make the petroglyph music rituals? Good question. Um, we think that, that there has been some debate. We do think that most of the petroglyphs made at Mesa Prieta, especially from the classic period onward, which for this region, what we're calling the classic period, uh, begins around 1300 to 1350 AD. Um, we believe that uh, the, the main community uh, were ancestors of the Tewa. We cannot rule out the possibility that uh, Tiwa also contributed and uh, that would especially be um, uh, worth considering if we do further studies of the northern end of the Mesa, uh, because it is very much in this liminal space between uh, Tewa lands and Tiwa lands. Um, the the Embudo Valley, so the area around Dixon, would have been traditional Tiwa farming lands. Uh, but for the most part, we do believe that the petroglyphs at Mesa Prieta were mostly produced by ancestors of the Tewa, especially after 1300 AD, which would account for uh, probably a solid 80% of our petroglyphs. Um, on, on that... Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the Tewa communities around today... Um, uh, the closest one today is Okeawinge, formerly San Juan Pueblo. So our our last speaker, uh, Art Cruz, from last month, uh, is from uh, Okeawinge. He is full-blooded Tewa from Okeawinge. So, um, yeah, uh, we try to work closely with Okeawinge. Um, we shouldn't ignore Santa Clara, uh, but there was another Pueblo close by, uh, uh, especially during the classic period, and that was what Art Cruz's talk was about, was uh, the Pueblo of Fioge near the uh, near the present. Sorry, uh, if you just catch me turning back, uh, I'm just making sure my dog isn't causing too much destruction here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyhow, um, uh, Art shared the story of Fioge Pueblo, and uh, Fioge uh, was very near the grounds of what is today Los Luceros. And uh, so we do believe that the residents of Fioge um, contributed significantly to the uh, to the corpus of petroglyphs at uh, Mesa Prieta. Uh, Fioge would have been a Tewa Pueblo. Um, there are certain caveats, of course, uh, prior to the Tewa migration into the area or the, the migration of the ancestral Tewa to the area. There were other residents uh, of the, the Rio Grande and the Chama, uh, so they probably do contribute some of the heritage uh, to some of the heritage of the peoples uh, of the native peoples in this area today. They probably also contributed at least somewhat to the uh, to the petroglyphs on the mesa. Um, 
And uh, of course, the uh, the pueblos all up and down the Rio Grande uh, exchanged with each other. Uh, which any time that you get economic exchange, you probably also get um, you probably also get people um, you know intermarrying in between these places. We also have a few petroglyphs that are done in very non pueblo styles that we think might be um, created by Comanche. Uh, this is both from the technique that they're use uh, that that was used to produce them as well as the subject matters. But for the most part, uh, Tewa from Fiogi and Oke Oinge are our strongest leads. So I'm going to uh, pull up the chat here and uh, let's see here. What What's our next? Okay. Do you know if these natural sound amphitheaters were used in connection to fertility rites? Good question. Um, I would say generally we cannot say definitively, but um, I, I certainly would think that that would be a, uh, a strong speculation on which to build a, hypo a hypothesis. Uh, Native American religions, especially of the Western United States, seem to have a uh, strong emphasis on uh, fertility and world renewal. So I would say it, it's a good hypothesis. Um, but uh, it's, hold on, my, my screen is being a little weird here. Yeah, um, whether or not that's specifically in these amphitheaters, whether you know, the amphitheaters are being used for something else starts to get a little bit more difficult to say. It, it really comes down to what kind of songs are being sung, really. If we're going to talk about the amphitheaters and sound and their, you know, their connection or lack of connection to fertility rights, um, it's, it's entirely possible, but um, we need to know more about what kind of songs uh, we're, we're being, uh, we're being sung. And, that comes down to we need to do ethnographic work and um, and take a good hard look at the iconography. So uh, Lorraine asks, uh, have any studies been done concerning the topographical influence on the formation of native language? Interesting question. Um, how topography influences language? I don't think I've seen a study on yet. Um, that said, uh, if you're looking for probably, um, I, I think that it is certainly landscape is remembered in the language. Uh, if I can, if I can reference some of the, the work that I did in, uh, the Death Valley area and in the Mojave desert, the groups there, um, the, the way that language was described was often in terms of body parts and much in the way that um, that hikers will describe the landscape today. So like, you know, the the foot of the mountain, the mouth of the canyon, the you know, et cetera, et cetera. The headwaters. Uh, uh, yeah. The headwaters of a water feature. So uh, there's that. And then. Uh, there's definitely, I mean, there are definitely oral traditions about things like sound. One of my favorites comes from the uh, the uh, indigenous residents of Beatty, Nevada, who are right on the edge of the traditional lands of the Timbisha Shoshone of Death Valley and the Pahrump Valley Paiute of, well, Pahrump Valley. Um, so they're probably Shoshone and or Paiute. Um, and uh, they have a story about Tsoepitze. Tsoepitze was a um, Tsoepitze was a uh, a doctor. She was a woman and a a doctor, as in a shamanic doctor. But she had no kids of her own, so she like kidnapped the kid and 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 took the kid uh, took the kid away from the village. 
But uh, Coyote and the other villagers were like not happy about this. So they tracked down Soapite. The kid gets freed. Soapite goes into hiding in a canyon and uh, crawls into the mouth of her spirit guide, uh, Togoav, the serpent. And there's a lot of symbolism in here that I'm not going to unpack. But uh, so she basically, this is a metaphor for going underground already inside the canyon so when coyote gets there and calls out so a where are you so a just mocked coyote by calling back so a where are you you know uh and so that's how so a became echo uh we have other similar stories from say utah of like how echoes come to be and usually it's a main character who ends up also becoming the namesake for echo so in that way, yeah, landscapes kind of have influenced language. But um, yeah, I don't think that there's really been systematic studies on that, at least not in North America. Um, so let's see here. I think uh, we've got to... Uh, I know uh, Judith Williams had a comment. Uh, I noticed a petroglyph on a trail behind the house showing a person with a bow over his head. I've never heard of people using bows to make sounds. Uh, it makes sense, though, when you consider the cello. Yes, Judith. In fact, um, the way that music bows are identified in the iconography of petroglyphs and pictographs around the world can often be related to the position that the, the bow is being held in. Um, so in... In Namibia and uh, South Africa, as in the country of South Africa, um, music bows will be depicted by people holding bows. But instead of instead of holding the bow like you're drawing the bow, it's held. There we go. Instead of instead of holding the bow vertical like you're drawing it, it's being held like this. If you imagine that this is curved so that they can strum it like that. So sometimes when you see bows held in awkward, awkward positions, like the, uh, the petroglyph of the person with a bow over his head, that could be an indication that it's being used as a music bow. And uh, yeah, I think looks like that might be all of our questions. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, of course, thank you, Ethan, for um, for uh, being the man behind the curtain again, um, for being the, uh, the 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 wise wizard of Oz. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I do want to remind you all once again: our uh, next installment of the Mesa Talks will be. Um, let, let, let's uh, <laughs> let's pull this up here so I don't get it wrong. Um, it, do tune in for our next installment uh, of the Mesa Talks. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, that will be Matt Barber, who will be talking about an archaeological perspective on hunting in New Mexico. And that'll uh, be the last Tuesday of July. Um, thank you uh, to Los Luceros State Historic Site. And um, I would like to uh, uh, let you all know, I do have a talk coming up on uh, July 10th that I'll be talking about, uh, this will be with Mesa Prieto's chat with the archeologist. I'll be talking about gender and non-binary gender in the archeological record of North America. So tune in for that. You all have a good evening. <laughs>